The Behemoth Brewing Company presents the Department of Conversation with Pat Brittenden. Behemoth, give me something hoppy. Are you related, sorry, are you related to the Brittenden, Brittenden, Brittendens? <laughs> there's two Brittenden families. Uh, there's a South Island. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's part of us, but he's not my direct sort of lineage. There was a split. There was a South Island Christchurch group. And there was sort of oh, a, yeah. a, to the North Island. I'm part of the North Island, so Dick Brittenden is in there. There's, there's only one family line, um, but I oh. like I never met him, unfortunately. Um, my old okay. my old man more went down the rugby line. He was involved with the Auckland Rugby referees and all that kind okay. of stuff. And and yeah, the, the Christ and my my grandfather played um, like rugby league and and cricket for Canterbury and the rest. Okay, stuff. so yeah, that's right. the that's the storyline. But thanks for joining us. It's um. It was lovely to lovely to see you as a as a uh, a, a boy and a teenager of the eighties. Obviously, you were part of the crew that uh, I idolised. So this is a real real pleasure and a real honour to have a chat with you this morning. Hey, look, no problem at all. I'm 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 sort of happy to be talking to someone that actually remembers sport in black and white. Uh, yeah, black and white. When did colour came? I always my my old man always told me I think colour came for the Commonwealth Games or the Olympics in the seventies, something like that. That's when colour TV turned up. Yeah, it might have been. Was it Christchurch Commonwealth Games? Yeah, I think might have that, been around then. I think that's when. Yeah. That's when. I, I I think I might have been born. I don't remember too much about that one myself, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I was thinking about you actually. Actually, thinking about how excited I was to talk to you. Thinking about um, watching you at Eden Park. I was an Auckland uh, Auckland boy and watching the games up there, and thinking uh, my one memory of you, or well, my one memory, but my strongest memory of you, uh, was your square cut, and you're playing square of the wicket, and as a young fella getting to the right position on the boundary where, I mean, this is what my memory is. You could tell me that maybe you didn't square cut all that much, but for some reason that's what I associate with you and getting the chance to jump over the fence at Eden Park over those white picket fences to the boundary, pick up the ball and throw it to whoever you were playing and get on TV doing it, coming home, having my mum have seen me jump over the fence and throw the ball back and telling me that the police come around because I'd done something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> these, these days you wouldn't even get home, Pat. You'd be arrested for jumping on the field of play. That's how much it's changed. Is the square cut? I, I think my teammates would probably would probably tell you that that was probably my best option. Uh, I won't say it was my only shot. It wasn't my only option. I, I quite like the sweep shot. Yeah. Um, these days, of course, I, I used to hit across the line to mid-wicket. Uh, in those days, it was called a slog, across the line slog. Now it's uh, the biggest money-making venture in the game. <laughs> well, uh, I could, could have been a millionaire out of the IPL. I was going to say, because you do sometimes associate shots with people, like you just mentioned the slog. I mean, you talk about Roscoe, I think slog sweep. Mm. You know, you, you, yeah. you have these shots that are associated with people. And as, I guess, a young fella, I always thought about you and that... Um, that kind of playing square of the wicket might have been wrong. Might have been yeah. just a, a young man, uh, a young boy with the wrong impression. But you know, I also remember uh, was pretty good at mimicking uh, Lance Kenz's bowling action, uh, and also, and also Paddle's little uh, jump at the start, uh, and I could do Snedden as well. The kind of way he used okay. to run in, and we used to mimic them in yeah. the backyard. So, yeah, yeah. good memories. Well, Ken, if you got Ken, Kenzie's one was unique, yeah, obviously. Um, you know, it was, it was such an amazingly. I mean, is there anyone played the game more differently than it was supposed to be played out of the out of the textbook than Lance Kens? I mean, uh, he's just phenomenally good at doing it his way, um, and that includes, of course, hitting it out of the ground whenever he felt like it. So, he, look, yeah, um, Sneddon, Hadley, if you perfected Hadley, I mean, that is that is the one. I mean, because Hadley perfected Hadley. If anyone else perfected Hadley, um, you'd be You'd be in a money-making situation, I feel, because it, in my view, from where I stood, with him running at me time after time, it was perfect. Is that that must be one of the most fun positions to play on the field, like keeper, because you're always in the action. I mean, I, I played cricket through school and after school, and uh, for Green Lane Club and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, a bit of a opening batter and a bit of a bit of a part-time bowler sort of thing, but. But you know, you get stuck on the boundary and you're out of the play for a while, and it gets a can get a bit boring in these longer games and stuff. But keeper must just be the best. You get to, you can't be any closer to the action, and and you've always got something to do. Yeah, well, that, that's true. I mean, it is. It's very busy because the likelihood uh, you're going to touch the ball every every time. One, it beats the bat, so it's, it's you. You're involved there. Two, he hits it, nicks it, and you're involved there. Uh, um, possibly he could hit it. 
for runs, you run it to the stumps, you get it there. Um, you know, so you're probably looking to touch the ball, I don't know, 80% of deliveries that are bowled. Uh, so it, it's, it is quite involved. These days, I think it's accentuated more because if you, if you really follow cricket now, you, you watch the way, particularly early in the innings, every time the ball is fielded, they throw it at 100 miles an hour back at the wicketkeeper. He wants to touch the ball. Uh, they want to get the throwing situation right. They want to feel as if they're part of the game. So it's almost a, it's almost a, a given that the wicketkeeper touches it more often these days. But you're right. I mean, that's why I liked it as a kid too. I mean, you know, I used to play cricket at Miramar Park and Kilburnie Park in, in Wellington. And it was, you know, certainly was the centre of attention. Although when I was growing up and, and was thinking mildly about being a serious wicketkeeper, we had a fellow by the name of Bruce Edgar in the team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, he could score runs, so he was always picked. Uh, and he was a wicketkeeper as well. So I had to stand in line for quite a while, to be fair. Are you still, though? What, first international game in 1980, last one, 1992? Pretty good career. And I mean... I was looking, it's, I, what I love doing is sometimes going into the stats and having a look like who's done what and whatever. I was surprised to see, and I have seen the Kerry Packer documentaries and all that kind of stuff, that you were number 38 cap for the One Day International, but you started in 1980. Something in my head said One Day had started much later in the in the 1970s, but on my research, it was 1973 was the first One Day International. That feels very early. Um, but still, not number thirty-eight one-day international cap. That's a it's a pretty low number. That must must be almost like a little uh, a little check mark on the CV to be in there nice and early. Yeah, it's pretty early on in the piece, isn't it? Yeah. If you look at the history of it. Yeah. I, I think um, you, you're like me in in that regard. I, I can't remember too much one-day cricket before that. Uh, I, I think Graham Dowling. I think way way back might have been captain of New Zealand when we played our first one-day international. Uh, but they played in white clothing. They played with the red ball. So all the conditions were exactly the same as the longer form of cricket. So it didn't appear to be that different, although it was over quicker. It was when, I think, you know, when the coloured clothing hit it, you know, with the white ball, the black side screen, the Packer series, uh, when, when those innovations kicked in, everyone, I think, finally decided or finally thought in their own minds that this actually is quite a different form of the game. Yeah. You know, that this is they play at night, for goodness sake. They play under lights. You know, what is this? They have a white ball at each end. Australia are in yellow, New Zealand and bay. Where do they get the base from? I thought New Zealand was always black and white, you know. Yeah. India were blue. Uh, you know, England were blue. Pakistan were green. It was like West Indies, who were a great side back in those days, were that beautiful maroon colour. Uh, and I think at that point, when World Series cricket became such a thing, I think people thought this is certainly a different form of the game, and man, do I love it. Yeah, if, I can't remember the number, but there's a very good docu series about Kerry Packer when he started that series up. I, I, I'm sure if people Google Kerry Packer docu series mm. One Day Cricket, and my enduring memory of watching it is every time he came into a production meeting, Kerry Packer, they'd added about another three cameras. So at the start, they were going to have more, because he wanted to turn it into a show, they were going to have more cameras. And so I don't know how many cameras there were for test matches. Let's say there was 10. There was 15. And then the next time he came back to the meeting, there was 18. The next meeting they had, there was 21. And all of a sudden, there was like 40 cameras. And every time that he came back to see how the production was going, there was more cameras because they wanted it bigger and brighter. And and I guess you look at the uh, T20 and probably primarily IPO right now is, is that's what it is. It's 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 not festival cricket in a patronising way like you watch a festival rugby game at the end of someone's career, but there is a festival nature of sort of excitement about it. They've kind of got to that point, perhaps that Kerry Packer was talking about in the seventies. Now, yeah, uh, look, you're right. And, and the other thing that's changed about it too is that it's become franchise based. A lot of it, it's not country based. You know, back in those days, it was basically country against country. And then it became association or state against state. But the IPL has changed it all together by, by having these wealthy uh, Indian owners, movie stars, businessmen, et cetera, owning their own teams. Therefore, you know, like British football or European football, actually having these multi, multi uh, valued teams that are, and the players are actually assets, which you can trade. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can get rid of one this this season and change them for another one or someone might buy them off you and you, you know or you might just sack them he might be gone and, and i think people have seen another side of it there it's more as a business venture but uh it works in india of course because of the the passion the population the passion for the game uh and you know they, i mean they just love everything and they idolize if you, you make it big in the ipl uh, you're certainly going to be pretty well looked after financially 
and and certainly you're going to be extremely well known, extremely well known. Hey Ian, uh, every sort of um, you know. Uh, I was going to say former athlete, whatever the correct term is that I've had on, like I had Grant Fox on and I asked him this question and I had Josh Cronfeld on and I asked him this question. I normally ask sort of towards the end, but seeing we're in this conversation about cricket now, um, I'll, I'll ask you this now. Um, the, In your opinion, uh, the greatest cricketer, and I know it's hard because there's such a, it's not like basketball where really everyone does the same thing slightly differently. There's such different skills, like a, a, a batter versus a bowler. Um, but I always like to ask, in your opinion, the greatest player ever uh, and then also the greatest player you played with or against because that, that might be different and then I also want to know what who the most exciting player, cricket player you've ever seen is and to, to caveat that what I often give as an example is Christian Cullen. Christian Cullen's the most exciting rugby player I've ever seen. He might not be the greatest, right. he might not be this, but, he, but you know he touched the ball and magic happened. He's a little bit like I, maybe Damien McKenzie's getting there, that excitement level. Touch the ball, something happens. Moanga, something happens. So, um, yeah, how about that? Greatest ever, greatest year either played with or against and most exciting cricket player. Don't know if you've ever <clears throat> done one of these with Nisbo, but um, if you ask Nisbo uh, who his greatest rugby player of all time is, Christian Cullen. Oh, so, wow. you know, uh, and he's seen a few, I'll tell you that. Uh, but it's a very easy answer for him. So, yeah, Cully. Uh, look, greatest player of, I, I believe, who's ever played the game. Well, contrary to popular belief, I never played against or saw Bradman play in person. So, I, I you know, and the numbers say he was. Yeah, but yeah. I, I can't say that I ever saw him. The most imposing player I ever played against, the one I remember the most for his presence at the crease, and his record backs that up as well. He's in everyone's... World 11 would be Viv Richards, Sir Vivian Richards. Wow, yeah, wow. I mean, he had a presence at the crease. They called him Smokey uh, after Joe Frazier. And that's what he came to the crease like. He never wore a helmet. And his cat just slightly tipped to the side. Rastafarian armbands, sweating, beads of sweat <laughs> coming off him. And, you know, you standing up to the stumps or whatever. When this man arrived at the crease, it was just like, wow. So he, that presence of Viv Richards at the crease, um, you know, I, I, it's very hard for me to isolate just one. But if you ask me to, to say him, I mean, I, I admired the beauty, the grace, uh, the timing of Greg Chappell, you know, who became public enemy number one there for a while as far as New Zealand sport was concerned. But uh, to stand behind the immaculately attired Greg Chappell with his baggy green on coming to the crease uh, <clears throat> and watching uh, the masterclass that he would put on a number of times was also... Uh, phenomenally good. So those those two batsmen would be the the, the best I, I, I ever stood behind. Um, and and if I, I look at the bowling, I got the end when I came to the bowling. I got the end of Lillian Thompson, and I, right. they were just over the top. So it wasn't lightningly fantastically quick. I caught the West Indies in the eighties. Um, so you faced you faced Big Bird. One, yeah, I got the bird. Uh, the bird got me off in too. Uh, incredible. <laughs> Uh, you know, big, big six foot eight, and then another arm on top of that. It's, you know, you never really got anything that like was going to hit the middle of the bat. It was always going to hit the splice, especially as a small guy. So very, very hard. But the most silky bowler, the one that probably created the most impression, was Michael Holding. Right. And one of the reasons why Pat he had the longest run up. So there's a lot of things go through your mind when Michael Holding is dancing his way towards you, and he was. They called him Whispering Death. Um, he just had this beautiful silky run up. So Mikey Holding uh, would be that. Uh, if I look at the guys I played with um, alongside well, Sir RJH, 431, without doubt, perfection with ball in hand. So often, in all conditions, he bowled magnificent spells. Um, and people will say, Saudi bowl, yeah, fantastic bowlers in their own right. Still a long way behind him on the wicket tally. Um, and, um, you know, you can it's very hard to compare errors with errors, but he dominated some great batsmen over the years. He really did dominate them. Um, great mate of mine, Martin Crowe, batting-wise. No problem there naming him as the best batsman I ever played with. That's very simple. Uh, and now I acknowledge the fact that uh, Williamson is going to break all his records. Yep. Uh, and Taylor as well. But if I had to name my three, four, five for New Zealand, Williamson, Crowe, Taylor, that's so damn easy. Um, because they just, you know, so very, very good. The, the three that stand out the most, quite, quite simply, the most. 
I um I remember you know Murray Decker used to do sports talk. He was a a, a a bastion of broadcasting in New Zealand. Um, he picked out. I can remember him talking about this young kid, Kane Williamson, when he was at high school, and he picked him out. And then he said he said at high school that he had the best technique of any batsman he had ever seen. And then he's just gone on to I guess be proven correct in what he does. Now you don't. He's the kind of batsman that you get out to the um you see him at the crease and you kind of think, well, well here's a pretty good, here's a he's a guaranteed forty at least. You know, if not more, he just seems to always have that time and capability, and yeah, he's amazing. He's an amazing player. Yeah, look, I, I first um, saw him as a kid. You know, I had a kid play against him, and I thought, well, you know, how good is he? When when they when they met up as as I think eleven year olds, twelve year olds, he was averaging three hundred and sixty five for the season. <laughs> Prolific, even then. I mean, you just knew in a country this size. You know, you just knew that he was going to be absolute standout material. And, man, standout he is, eh? Hey? He's just something. Hey, um, the, most people, I guess, hear and see you now is, is in your in your commentary role. Obviously, you're at last night's game, and I think I'm getting you in the in a, in the hotel in the morning. So thanks for giving us some time after that. What did you think of the game last night? Yeah, I, I, I've been very, uh, very mildly surprised, but uh, pleased to see commitment from Fiji. Uh, the last two weeks... I think they've been, even though, the, you know, you look at the score and think 50-odd, 60-odd, uh, I think probably two of the better weeks uh, of, I think, um, credibility and, and confidence building for Fiji rugby that I can remember. They've had some terrible hidings over the year and they don't, over the years, and they don't tend to play a lot of games, high-profile games. Mm. I think it's only the third and fourth time we've played them. And, and it's like, really? Uh, so what, they were brilliant. They really made the All Blacks. I mean, after the 102 mil hiding that uh, they gave Tonga, I don't really think Ian Foster, Grant Fox, got too much out of that. To be fair, I don't think you can. But they certainly got something out of the last two weeks. They found out a bit about their players, and they, you know, they were reassured about a couple of things, and and they maybe found out a, a couple of things about players that might have might missed the boat. You know, so it, it was what they wanted. Um, I think All Blacks never in doubt about winning their two games. Um, but in the first game in particular, they weren't bossing Fiji for a long, long time. But uh, I think they were more comfortable last night, to be fair. Yeah, I um, I, I, I echo what you're saying. I, I was thinking at the start of the season, God, why didn't we just do a, a three-series a three a three series of North versus South? Because that game last year mm. was like one of the greatest games of rugby there's ever been. Let's, let's start mm. it this year and let's do the state of origin rugby in North versus South. But actually, Fiji has been... You know, especially in that first this this time around, maybe first twenty minutes, but last week and the probably first fifty minutes have been a good competition. And ironically, I was watching something on ESPN this week, and they showed the um, U.S. basketball team against Nigeria, and they showed the path that Nigeria has taken. And like two Olympics ago, they got beaten by hundred points, eighty points. You know, one Olympic ago, they got beaten by fifty points. And this week, just gone, uh, the Nigerians beat USA in mm. basketball. And so even though it seems, you know, 80 points, 50 points is terrible, you can see that progression of improvement. Um, and when I heard, I think it was in the first test, I don't know if it was Nisbo, but one of the commentators saying that 14 of the squad play in France and I think five play in Scotland and five play in Ireland or something yeah. like that, you can yeah. you can see the professional element coming into the team. And yes, it was still a drubbing overall, but it's that, it's that, it's that increase in... Uh, in performance is coming and who knows maybe in after this next rugby world cup maybe it'll be more like a 10 point one i mean who knows i'm being yeah. arrogant saying it's a win, but you can see it I, I, I totally agree with you and i you know i spoke to both Ian cotter and uh, Ian foster after the game formally on television but so, uh, privately off camera and I, I asked both of them you know what needs to happen now and they, they both agreed that fiji have to keep playing you know they, they, it's no point just saying, well, like, remember those two weeks uh, in New Zealand where they were competitive and they looked like a really good side that could really threaten a lot of international teams? And then, you know, but that was six months ago and they haven't played since. Well, they, that can't happen. That, that cannot happen. Whilst those guys are available and you can have them, they've got to keep building. I mean, I, look, I, I reckon on that performance last week in Dunedin, they may well, they, that side may well have really threatened Australia or France or that I've just been watching. I think they would have gone real close, really close. Yeah, no, and I'm very happy. I mean, I have a very soft spot for Fiji. It had a lot to do with the, the country, and mum and dad had mm. business over there and stuff while I was a teenager as well, so it's always been sort of 
my second choice country, as everyone sort of has as well. So that was great. Um, speaking of the the French Wallabies game, have you have you watched the game? Have you have you seen the result there? Yeah, I did. I, didn't, I, I, I did watch the one. I didn't want to spoil it for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I just, I mean, they're, they're all the same, weren't they? All three of them went down to the wire. Uh, I think uh, France will kick themselves for not wrapping it up 2-0 because they won. The, they should have won the first one when they, they gave it away. Uh, then, of course, they won the second one in the last minute or so. Uh, and then, basically, they uh, they couldn't win last night against, what, 14 men for 70-something minutes? Yeah, four and what, and what did you make of it? Is that, what, I mean, that's another point, isn't it? I mean, you obviously clearly watch a lot of sport, a lot of rugby. Um, what are they going to do about these these sort of sending offs? I mean, was that sending off material? I mean, there's a huge debate about it. Well, let's uh, say, was it sending? Was it enough to ruin a game? Well, it didn't ruin it in the end, but was it enough to potentially ruin a game? Oh, well, let's have a look at it. People who want to know what we're talking about, this is called fair use in the world of journalism. We're going to have a look at the thing you're talking about. This is actually what happened, and I'll show you. I'll show you the the thing that I thought from it. So that was the hit. That was the hit that was yeah. deemed too high. And to be honest with you. From that angle and any of the replays they show, it seemed to be okay to me. Um, but we don't see all the angles. This is the most telling thing. I want you to watch the referee on the left-hand side when he asks them about contact to the head. He shrugs his shoulders like, uh, and then they make the decision. You watch this. This guy okay. here. We're back on you now, Ben. This guy. Okay, so you're saying we've got direct contact to the head. See that? See the shrug of the shoulders? Yeah. So if, yeah. the, if the guys on the field, if any one of them is shrugging their shoulders, I kind of think, mm. yeah. I, I don't agree as long as it's consistent um, because when you have an absolute black and white rule, and at the moment it seems to be if there is contact with the head, if there are no mitigating factors, it's a red. If there are mitigating factors, it's a yellow. I don't agree with that because basically they're saying if there's contact with the head, no matter what, you're, you're spending time on the sideline because sometimes there's contact with the head, which is completely accidental, which is non-consequential, and um, it does and can ruin a game. So I think they've got themselves in a hole because you can't really blame the referees because the referees have been told if there is contact with the head, it's punitive. If they've been told that, they got to do it. So it should be higher up the order, and they should. I mean, referees do it all the time. They 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 offer an advantage. I mean, that's basically them using their discretion um, to say something better may happen. They use their discretion on the field all the time. I think hard yeah. and fast rules, black and white rules, unfortunately, sometimes can be detrimental to the game. And last night, you have to applaud the Wallabies. You know, to win with 14 for 75 minutes. I mean, France probably should have won that. It goes to show that Australia, either Australia is stronger than we thought, or maybe France is a bit weaker than we thought. Yeah, I, I think a bit of both. Mm. I, I, I really, you know, I think they're always going to grow under Dave Rennie. They're always going to get better, you know, and, and time out in the middle will, will be fine. Actually, incidentally, all those referees were New Zealanders, by the by, uh, you know, uh, and the guy you were circling was uh, Brendan Pickerel, who's made giant strides into getting into international refereeing, but they were thrown in there. And, and even at halftime, I listened to Tim Horan, who I've got great respect for. Uh, and Tim Horan, just, um, Jason Hall, I think, isn't it? Yeah, Hall. Uh, both both said uh, at the time, David Hall, both said at the time, um, look, no, no foul on referees because they are told to. It's an IRB issue. Yeah. So you're dead right in that regard. It's an IRB issue. Uh, it's, it's probably not the right decision in terms of the game, but under the st structure of the way the game should be refereed at the moment, it was probably the right decision. So you've got to be so careful about the whole deal. And uh, it was interesting to see Sonny Bill Williams uh, was on the panel uh, last night. I don't know if you saw that no, um, after the, uh, at, at uh, halftime and after the game. Of course, Sonny Bill Williams, same. You know, he, he got caught in one as well, didn't he? Uh, and red carded an all-black jersey. So was quite interesting to hear his thoughts and he said I just still just don't understand it so basically I, I just think I'll give you another example I think the idea of referee discretion should should be something that's encouraged I mean I have always thought that when you throw the ball into the line out if you don't throw it straight but the opposition hasn't jumped then they've lost no advantage because <laughs> because if they don't jump and you don't throw it straight then that's on them if they jump and you don't throw it straight then fair enough, they've lost an advantage because they couldn't reach it. But if they don't jump, they've lost no advantage. The referee should be able to have the discretion to let that play on. Because what's happened is the it's the little ticky tacky, 
you know, fouls that go um, letter of the law that I think could be, and not at the moment. I love rugby. I'm a, I'm a, I'm not a rugby head, but I'm, I'm in right. Um, but it's the little tiny ones like that, or the things where there are no, uh, there's no gray area, and it can be a bad uh, a decision that impacts a game that could affect the game detrimentally long, long term. Yeah. Hey, look, totally with you, um, man. You'd have heard us say that in commentary uh, over the years. They didn't jump. They didn't want the ball. They, they had actually given the ball away. So why stop the game? Yeah. Why, why stop the game in that regard? Okay, yeah, I'll throw a scenario back at you since we're having a Sunday morning chat. <laughs> but um, can you draw a parallel, though? Can you draw a parallel? Um, let's go to cricket, compare cricket. Now, in my playing day, there were two umpires on the field, one at each end. They hardly ever conferred about anything. They made their decision and they stayed by it. You look at cricket now. How many decisions are clean decisions now without consultation? Look at rugby league. How often do they go to the bunker for, for the most minuscule things because there's an element of doubt? Maybe. Maybe there's an element of doubt. Game stops. Now, has this crept into rugby as well? You know it has crept into rugby. They're all wired up. The two ARs, not touch judges anymore, assistant referees. So that says it in itself. To, the two assistant referees are wired to the referee, are wired to the TMO upstairs. Now, if they all have an opinion, they all jump in and all have an opinion. I mean, you, you're looking at scenarios where games are running 14, 15 minutes over time because of the chats they're having about. So the game's losing its momentum the whole time. But if you give them the more scenarios or the more opportunity to doubt themselves and to consult with others, the more you give, the more mistakes are going to be made and the less confident they're going to have in doing the job that they're doing. And Justin Marshall made a really good point last night. We cannot be in this situation because all games are on the big screen now, uh, these major games. You cannot have a situation where a group of players think they may have seen something on the big screen, stop the game and, and challenge the referee to go back and look at it. We saw that last night in the test match and they overturned the decision uh, the, on the whim of, of, of Sam... Whitelock challenging or not challenging, but discussing the decision with them. There's no, there's no player, a captain's challenge in international rugby, but because they've been using it, they used it and they overturned the decision against Fiji. Uh, do we want that? I mean, it just, it's just diluting the whole officiating system because you're coming out with more avenues to doubt. Uh, sounds like you've got your first two hours of your uh, new morning show on Sen sorted out for tomorrow morning from this chat there, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 ta I'll tell you what I think. And I think the overturn one you're talking about is catching the ball. The Fijian uh, winger who caught the ball then stepped yeah. out. That was the overturn. Yeah. Uh, there, there's two things, right? I think that um, I think it was in Australia and I think it was cricket where they didn't used to show replays on the big screen back in the day. Correct. Um, yeah. there, there's a way around the stadium issue. Now that's going to involve technology. It's not going to be just we put the Sky feed up there or the New Zealand what is it Spark Sport feed or whatever is carrying that one at the time. Um, and they didn't show replays, and that was the way around that. But I think what they should be doing is there should be a time frame on the AR. They should force the official to make a decision, and then check it if they feel they need to. So therefore, they go like this: it's a try. The ARs go, let's check that. Okay, let's check that. We've got 60 seconds. If you can't find anything within that 60-second window, then the on-field mm. decision stands. Because I don't mind necessarily the, the checking things, but it's the checking things that then take four minutes to come back with an answer. So give them a, give them a clock. It's like if you don't find any mitigating evidence that changes my on-field decision within 60 seconds, then we're moving on. It's a try. Some, I don't know, something mm. like that to keep the game, yep. e even though it is a pause, it's more moving. And the other thing about officials is they don't, because they, they're they in their same group of guys, they mix together, they, they end up being great mates. And they don't want to, they don't want to shit on the other guy, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Can I say that on this? You, you know, can, they don't, so they, don't they don't want to, um, they don't want to embarrass the other guy by, you know, pulling him up on something he's done. So that it's generally an umpire or a referee support system as opposed to a review system. That, that's effectively what it, what it's turned out to be. You have to have really, really huge evidence to over, for a TMO to overturn an on-the-field decision, you know, because they don't like doing it. What's, the other thing that really is, is quite frustrating, the length of an advantage these days. Yeah, now, what, what, how long should an advantage go? I mean, you said 60 seconds. To look at it. How many phases do we have to go through? How many times do they have to cross the advantage line, put the ball through how many sets of hands, before it really should be over. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was a conversation I heard last night as well. There was maybe three phases, and then they went back for the penalty. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I guess the question is, when do you lose an advantage? I, there was a mm. there was a time, and I remember Aaron Smith doing it actually, where there would be a penalty, and he'd just knock the ball on on purpose to get the penalty mm. immediately because they knew that, that that would be their advantage. Yeah, you, you get on with the game, though, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You, know, you don't you don't play you don't play for a minute under advantage, and then come back when it all turns to nothing anyway, and you go back to, to where you were. So you, uh, I don't know, how many opportunities do you deserve for a knock-on or a, you know, a, 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 a piece of offside play or something? How many, how many do you deserve? Yeah. I think uh, the thing I like about the um, the reviews in cricket is the the video reviews seem to be there to stop the clangor, as they say. You know, the really terrible mistake, which is why you've got that it's umpire's call. It could have been in, it could have been out. We'll stay with the on field decision. I, I like that, although it's frustrating when you want your team to get the, you know, get the get the get the wicket or whatever it is. And I think in yeah. the it's not the review question, but I, it feels like with the advantage in rugby. I feel like if I've got advantage in rugby, not that I'm anywhere near playing days these days, but I want to try something out of the box to try and score. Like that's when I kick to the wing or that's when I try something crazy to because I have the advantage. But it seems at the moment they just trudge on. Like nothing, you get the advantage and nothing changes. I would think yeah. that what would make more sense is you get the advantage and you go, oh, we've, we've got it. It's like a free hit in cricket. We've got a free hit. What can we try here to get this? Oh, no, that didn't work. Let's go back for the penalty then. But it seems that trudging on, then you, you get two, three, four, five more phases of rugby and you're only 15 metres up the field, so they come back for the, um, try, for the penalty. Try to, explain, try, try to explain to someone who doesn't know too much about cricket but wants to learn how in an umpiring review situation, a ball can hit the stumps and be not out, and a ball can hit the stumps and be out. Yeah. Try to explain that to somebody. <laughs> well, as I just did to you, I've done this to someone recently and said, you know, yeah. it's, to, it's to stop the clangers. And to be honest, I think we all remember, I can't remember who it was, but there was an AR decision that was the opposite of what had happened. Like, didn't something happen like it was, it hit the wickets, and then an AR decision showed it missing the wickets or something like that. That was in the last kind of five years. So they're not yeah. perfect, but they're a, they're no, a they're guideline. Not. No, they're not. They're, they're run by a set of cameras. Like sometimes players get in front of those cameras. You know, those, those cameras uh, are, are all around the ground with different angles, but players get involved. Umpires get in front. They, they lose certain angles from time to time. So it's, it's absolutely not a 100% foolproof system, but it's foolproof enough that the ICC have approved it and that's that's why we live with it. That's that's the cricket side of it anyway. Um, do you think, in your opinion, uh, the cricket Test World Championship that we won what two weeks ago, is a greater mm. result for New Zealand sport than a Rugby World Cup win? Can you compare them? Um, yeah, I, I think I, I really do think it, it's a totally different structured system. Um, you, you, because the World Cup is is a tournament, so it, people will view a tournament differently um, because it's more concise it's, it, the atmosphere around that it's, it's it's all at one venue or in terms of a country or whatever uh, and so it's, it's easily I think more identifiable as as a you know as a as an entity whereas the the world test championship is played in all different countries most of the, a lot of the games are out of sight for us we don't see them we read about the result of them on stuff or crick info or, or, or whatever and we find out about them there um, but we we don't we don't sort of associate it with being um, you know a, a, an actual tournament so or an event. So w it's only when it gets to the the world final as such that the real focus comes there. I, I think what they've got to do um, to me is 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 it you know we're we're now entering into world Test cricket for the next World Test Championship. So all these games, every game should matter for a start. We shouldn't have these series where Test matches are meaningless. You know, and we've played four now against England that have meant nothing, meant nothing. Two over here and two over there have meant nothing. I don't understand that. I really don't understand that. So um, I think we, we have to make the public more aware of the points table, the system, um, because it's it's all guesswork at the moment. Obviously, too, Pat, it's, it's been an, um, a non-typical one this time around because of COVID. If you look at the number of games played by, by certain countries compared to other countries, there's a serious imbalance there, but you have to do and live with what, what we're able to do. the sign of the times at the moment. So there's a few things I think that, that, you know, they have to look at there. But to answer your question, 
Yeah, I do. I, mm. I do believe you know, because it's it's not easy to get to a final. It's not easy to get to a final. You know, in a, in a fair system, you're going to play a lot of cricket away from home in foreign conditions. So to get to that grand final uh, and to win it, I mark that down as the equivalent of us winning uh, the World Rugby Cup. Yes, I do. Yep. Uh, um, it sounds like we're also setting up, there's a poll for you for tomorrow, because Sen's newest morning host starts tomorrow, 9am, on the Sen's New Zealand mm. Network. Uh, so there's your poll, which is greater, Rugby World Cup, Cricket World, uh, cricket World Cup final. Um, tell me about, I, I, I remember hearing you commentating rugby, thinking, what the hell's going on here? This is a cricket player, mm-hmm. what's going on? Are you possibly the first in New Zealand sort of, uh, crossover uh, crossover commentator who's basically a commentator who's not an ex-cricketer who commentates cricket or an ex-rugby player who commentates but, but does them both and does them well. Um, was there anyone before you that you know of? Oh, I'm not sure there's anyone before me. There, you know, there were there's certainly journalists or professional commentators like the Peter Williams, you know, the, the Graham Nisbets, the Brian Waddles who, who did dual sports uh, because they, they were brought up in the broadcasting system through the cadet school and everything so uh, they became all-round commentators and very, very good at what they did, just by the by. So, um, look, I, I think I'm probably, in terms of males, the first one that, who's been on the field for that length of time and and crossed from cricket across to rugby. Um, but if, if, if you look at Leslie Murdoch, for instance, yeah, Leslie yeah. Murdoch, a dual, dual international um, uh, and a fantastic commentator, and both does rugby sideline work on radio. So... I think TV people tend to get more high profile because it's pictures and, you know, it, it, and more people are able to access it, I guess. So, you know, you, you tend to rate TV in that, that regard, but uh, I probably am. It's, a, it's an interesting story. Really. Why it's one of the most asked questions I have probably, you know, it's like, it's a, you, you kind of think that when a guy's played cricket, I played till I was 34, you know, that's the only thing you can ever do in life. <laughs> but, you know, if, if I didn't make any money out of cricket, you know, I played in the, pretty much an amateur era. I got a little bit of money towards the end of it, but I never had enough money out of cricket to set my family up or, or to build a mansion or a beach house or anything like that. Honestly, I came out of it with diddly squat. So I basically had to find a job, um, and that's 1992. And I was very lucky because um, a, a position in the commentary team for TVNZ opened up at that point, and uh, I was the first guy that they rang, principally, I think, because I'd done some work for them. Right. over the years while I was still playing and helped them out. So they gave me the first opportunity. Unfortunately, it worked for me. Uh, and then, of course, they lost the rights to Sky TV, uh, the cricket, and Sky got the rugby as well. So uh, a fellow by the name of Kevin Cameron, who was the boss of uh, Sky at the time in terms of talent, she came to me and said, oh, I want you to, uh, we, we've won the cricket rights, so I want you to work for us as a uh, head, co- uh, head cricket commentator. I said, that'd be great. He said, I'm going to employ you for 12 months of the year. And I said, well, like cricket's, what, four months, five months at the most? He said, no, actually, I think I've got a job for you in rugby. And I thought, well, really? I mean, I'm like most people. He said, yeah, I, I, we're going to sort of set up a role for a, a sideline guy. We don't necessarily want him to be the biggest expert in the game, but we want him to be able to relate to players, to relate to atmosphere, relate to coaches, um, doing a lot of interviewing work. And we kind of feel that you might be able to do it as something completely out of left field. But because what you've achieved um, in, in cricket and your, your previous broadcasting, they might give you the time of day. And whether they, whether they do or not, or whether you get it right or wrong, um, is up to you. Um, so basically, good luck. Are you interested? So, you know, that's how it came about. And that was like, 1999, I think, 1998, 99. So it's been a long thing. A lot of people say, I still, every now and then, hear people say like what's he doing doing rugby you know he was a wicket keeper <laughs> it's like it's like you know it's like a guy that leaves school goes into banking and all of a sudden someone gives him an opportunity um you know to uh, sell cars or, or or do something completely different uh, and and that's it and, and that happened for me at the age of 34 i mean i still had 31 years left before i could get the pension <laughs> <laughs> what, what am i going to do here i mean and i've, I've always loved sport you know, I, I absolutely love sport, and I've always, even while I was playing, loved sport commentary, not just in cricket or rugby, across the board. I mean, man, some great commentators. Wimbledon, you know, those those iconic voices of those events around the world that, that I, you know, I fell in love with. And, and British football, Brian Moore and, and John Watson and, and now Martin Tyler, Bill McLaren and rugby, that, Keith Quinn, 
you know, iconic voices. Uh, Alan Richards, Brian Waddle, um, Ian Galloway, you know, silky Ian Galloway's beautiful tones. Jim Reed, I mean, uh, cricket on the transistor while you're at the beach, sports roundup. Brilliant. Absolutely. I love, I live for that. Every day I woke up in summer, that was the first thing I wanted on the radio. Sport, mate. Sport. And now I'm lucky enough to be part of it. Yeah, so let's have a look at that. I mean, because uh, thanks to COVID last year, we lost New Zealand's sort of fully dedicated sports radio network. Um, well, whether that was because of COVID or whether it was a business decision, who knows? I feel some businesses shut down during that period uh, and they yeah. used COVID to shut down. I'm not entirely sure how it went. But there is a brand new uh, network starting up tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Now, um, if people want to find out more about that, um, I guess they just got to look up SENS because I've had a bit of a look around and can't find the frequencies very easily as to where they're okay. at. But I'm sure... I, look, I'll, I'll put them on the Facebook page. We're talking Sunday morning. This will be going up um, Sunday night. So I'll try and find them in between and, and, and put yeah. them up there as well. But, you know, um, New Zealand knows Mark Stafford from his TAB days, I guess. And then you've got um, uh, Ricky Swinnell and you've got Iz- Izzy Dagg and Brennan McCullum doing the uh, the breakfast show. Uh, yourself there in the morning. Kirsty Stanaway, Stephen Donald, Beaver's on there as well. A full roundup 24-7 sport coming back. And I have to say, I don't listen to a lot of radio these days i listen to a lot of podcasts but yes. when i get in the car the one thing i would turn on was radio sport right because yeah. that was the thing i'd listen to so to have sport radio in the in the form of sins coming back i'm very excited to buy because i don't know maybe my radio and my car will yep. start to get used again go go to um uh, the app there's an app s-e-n-z we actually to be honest pat we're not allowed to call it sins we aren't you can but we're not. It's just, we, we're going to call it S E N Z, right? Okay. Um, so it's it's an offshoot of S E N in Australia, uh, Sport and Entertainment Network. So it's S E N Z, and, and uh, you go to the app there, and that'll have all the frequencies on it. Uh, people will associate it with the trackside frequencies. Remember when trackside went yep. off air as well? Yep, yep, yep. All those frequencies around the country. So you you will be able to get it nationwide in your car as you travel around the country so yeah so we we kick off tomorrow morning at uh, six o'clock uh with with baz and izzy um and then I, I take over at nine i can tell you i'm not sure what's on their show at the moment but um our issues we're gonna the first guy i'm gonna have on i mean is sam kane now okay oh, sam cool. kane's not playing all black captain at the moment but for me i mean he's still got the heart the biggest job in the country he's the captain of the all blacks uh, he's getting closer to being back. We'll, uh, we'll find out from Sam exactly when he'll be available. Um, and, of course, um, uh, he was uh, – I noticed last night he was very much in the all-black camp. Um, so I just want to know how close he was. And, 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 and I just – his impression of Fiji and, and where the all-blacks are at and that sort of thing. I don't expect him to be too super critical of any of the individuals because he's their skipper and that's not the way things are done. But I just, I just kind of feel we, we haven't heard from him for a while and he is the designated – all black captain. Uh, the other uh, issue we're talking about, and I'll bet you do something on this, or you might have already, is the Laurel Hubbard issue, yeah. which is going to be massive, mate. It, I, I don't know if you have yet, but when she it gets closer to a Laurel competing, I, I think it's going to be one of the biggest emotive issues in sport that we've had for a long, long time in this country. I won't say it's going to divide a nation, but uh, at the moment, uh, it's either yes or no, isn't it? And it's mostly no. I'd say 90%, 95% of New Zealand people say it just doesn't sound right. It just not, it's not going to look right. So what what I've done is already um, I've spoken to two people, uh, two women. One uh, is a university professor out of um, Waikato who's an expert in this field yep. on the subject of uh, trans athletes and when I asked her right at the very end, uh, should she be able to compete? Should Laurel Hubbard be able to compete? She, uh, it was a long pause, actually. So there's an interview worth listening to. That'll be on. And they'll also interview, and put one in the can, too, uh, a lady by the name of Joanna, Joanna Harper, who's an advocate. She's trans herself. She um, transitioned uh, from male to female when she was 47 years of age. She's now 64. Uh, she's been used as a consultant by the IO, uh, the Olympic Committee. She's also been used uh, uh, when um, World Rugby decided whether trans rugby players could could actually play the game. She was used as one of the two consultants, and they, and they consequently said, "No, we don't want them in our game at the moment. We feel it's too risky." So, um, so you know that 
that's an issue I'm going to sort of work in in the next five, six, seven days before, and then, uh, because I just feel that. Also, um, tomorrow, um, I'm going to talk to Stu Wilson, and the reason I'm talking to Stu Wilson is not so, you know, we're going to get uh, some funny stuff. Uh, very serious issue of uh, the 40th anniversary of the Springbok Tour, 1981. Of course, right yeah. Right now, yeah. So, uh, Stewie played the three tests, played two at centre, which is a good pub question, and then he played um, on the wing, and the last one scored a try, and the last, the flower bomb test at Eden Park. So, we're going to relive those moments uh, 40 years ago with Stewie. Um, I My memory of that, I mean, uh, by the way, there's the, uh, there's the Sens app. All downloaded, yep. ready to go. Yep. Um, my memory of 81, I was only six or seven, eight, seven or eight, was uh, I never went to the test matches. My dad did, I'm sure. Um, but going to see an Auckland game either the week before or the week after um, at Eden Park and the barbed wire being up. So I can remember mm. the barbed wire being up like not just on the day, but the days around it, obviously. It was probably before, I guess, to protect the field from what happened in Waikato, yeah. I'm guessing. But look, on the on the Laurel Hubbard thing as well, um, we have talked about that quite a bit, not just Laurel Hubbard, because I think it's really important. Like, when the question gets asked, should Laurel Hubbard be allowed to compete? The answer is yes, because it's a bit like the referees, because those are the rules right now. Mm. So it's actually nothing to do with Laurel Hubbard. She's abiding by all the rules. The rules are in place. She's able to. If you want to go to the next level of conversation, which is um, should transgender athletes be in the Olympics, that's another conversation altogether. But I, I hope, I know, I'm, and I'm being a bit naive saying this, but I hope Laurel Hubbard doesn't get a lot of kickback because she's just, she hasn't set the rules. She hasn't pushed for the rules. She's actually been very quiet and stayed out of the limelight. And she's just adhering to the rules that are in there and, and being accepted. So, I'm just I'm I'm hoping she's kind of safe and well and and is not getting attacked for it. Well, yep. it's naive. Totally. That's naive saying she's not being because obviously there's there's always dicks out there, you know. But but the question above that is a, an interesting one, and uh, mm. yeah, we're looking to do something leading up to the Olympics here as well. Yeah. Hey, look, I, I thank everyone. Well, yeah, you've had a you've had a foray into radio before because Radio Live Live had a um sports radio for a while. <clears throat> is it sport? It was called Sports Live. Is that right? Uh, B, B Sport Breakfast. B Sport, B Sport Breakfast. Yeah. Uh, with Nathan Rarity. Yeah. We also had uh, we had Dean Lonigan on there um, and Jeff Wilson as well. So uh, we had uh, about five or six years of getting up at four in the morning, mate, which I'm not a huge fan of. That's <laughs> one of the greatest things about nine or 12 is you can still get up at seven or 7.30 and do a bit of research, et cetera. But um, yeah, so yeah, we, we went we went through that process, but again, that was another one that fell victim of uh, finance, and and you know, so you, you got to be. It's just not a fait accompli that you set these things up and it just runs like clockwork. You've got to put a lot of work in. People have got to market it. Um, there's a, a lot of really good people. Um, a, a, lot, a lot. I've been surprised at the number of people that have wanted to be involved, and, and the reason why is that they love sport. You know, they, they love sport, they love talking about it, they love selling it. And, you know, and you, you're doing that right now. I mean, there's a lot of people who want to be able to uh, get part of this. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's empty piece of paper project starting from scratch. It's not like, um, you know, it's, it's we're taking over from anything. This is damn brand spanking new. So tomorrow morning we switch on the power at six o'clock. And away we go. Simple as that. And the group SEN in, in Australia is obviously pretty uh, pretty resourced and pretty powerful. If you have a look at their actual website, you know, uh, Cameron Smith, Maddie Johns, Adam Gilchrist, Gillian Goss, they've got a pretty Vossies in there as well. They've got a pretty uh, heavyweight group of broadcasters and former athletes in there already. So it's going to be, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, we're going to start to get feeds from their shows. I don't know if it's going to be weekends or whether yep. as well through the New Zealand networks, but which will be, which is exciting. Kind of the first maybe Australasian radio station on some level. Well, 24 hours. We're on 24 hours a day, right? We don't just knock off at seven o'clock at night when the um, when the drive show finishes. Uh, Ricardo Ball, you, you'll know Ricardo oh, yeah. Ball, who's been in, in radio for a long, long time. Massive football fan. Uh, he's going to be heavily involved in the nighttime goes. Uh, there'll be Australian shows coming in. They're going to get sporting rights as well. So at the moment, I think they've already signed the rights to the Warriors game, play-by-play. Play. Uh, they're going to work, I'm sure, on rugby and cricket. 
uh, to make sure that they, there's exposure of those games coming in from around the world throughout the night. So, uh, look, hey, um, as you said, that, that lineup you just shown, and the other good thing about that is, of course, um, you know, there's a lot of people that will ring us, and they'll ring us, they'll ring us when they want some information about New Zealand cricket or busy with rugby, etc. Uh, Beaver, uh, and then um, then we can tap into their market as well. I mean, you know, you can't get bigger than the you know, Matty Johns and, and Andrew Voss. I got Vossi on tomorrow morning, actually, on Rugby League. So, um, and, and then, of course, it's the Ashes coming up, which you and I will be glued to, because <laughs> that is just fantastic. Um, and that's coming in on Sky, but it, it hopefully it will also be coming, but so it will be coming in on um, SENZ. But Gilly, um, you know, we've got access to Gilly Heels, Ian Healy. Um, we've got those guys across the board, and so, you know, we'll, we'll be pretty well informed as to what's going on. Yeah, it's very excited. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited by it. Hey, um, I, I think one last question before we let you go, Smithy, if that's okay. And that's the Olympics coming mm. up. Um, yep. I, I, I want to get your just your, your excitement, feedback about what's going on. Oh, but no, before, sorry, one, one quick question. Uh, your particular show, nine till midday weekdays on SENZ, uh, SENZ, sorry, is that going to have a call-in uh, component as well? People yep. phoning up and Absolutely. chatting. Oh, cool. That's, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, I got a bulls. I got a bulls on before here. Don't worry. You know? <laughs> <laughs> hit me. Hit uh, me with your rhythm stick. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm. I'm. Yeah, certainly there'll be uh, player participation. Don't worry. Yeah. So the Olympics. Um, obviously, you guys will be covering that heaps because it's the biggest sporting event in the world. Um, yep. Have you guys talked about a contingency plan for if it gets cancelled? We heard that there is the first COVID case in the village. I think that was in the news yesterday in the athletes' village, mm-hmm. and there's a part of me going, mm, who's going to be the first to say it? Who's going to be the first to say this isn't going to happen? And I'm wondering how you guys, I'm wondering about where thoughts around the Olympics are, maybe what excites you, what you're looking forward to, but also, you know, that other kind of dark, ominous cloud having just in the background, which we yeah. all hope doesn't hit, but if hits, what's going to happen? Well, look, here's my take on it. There's is, is so much money involved. They'll do everything possible to make sure it goes ahead. Uh, you know, you know, there's so much money being invested into this. There's so many television rights. There's so much income uh, that would go by the wayside if it didn't eventuate. So they will literally bend over backwards as far as they can go to make sure that this goes ahead. I'm like you. Um, you know, I've now lived through COVID like everybody, and things just get called off. And, you know, things, uh, you know, just don't happen anymore when COVID's floating around the scene and, you know, the safe measure is taking. I cannot imagine that it, it's, you know, you, you've mentioned one case already. I understand there's been several cases uh, of people coming in who tested negative when they left home, but all of a sudden they're positive when they get there. Uh, how that quite works, I do not know. But, you know, I, I can't un- I can't imagine already no fans. I mean, there's a disruption. Olympics without any fans. Yeah. Goodness me. Uh, so... How do I mean? I'm very, very skeptical. I'll say this, and I'm 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 pretty much an optimist because I love sport. And I love the Olympics, but I can't see it. Um, I really can't see it going through with certain events, maybe, you know, not being held. Certain disciplines not being able to take place because COVID is in their discipline or in their part. Um, you know, you know whether it's in the equestrian side of things. Uh, is it possible that the whole equestrian thing gets knocked on? You know, I can see it'll get going. I can see they'll 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 get it going, but in terms of uh, the content, will we see 100% content? No, I don't think we will. Will we see the, it go the distance? Maybe, maybe it'll go the distance because what hasn't happened quite yet, right? Is politics hasn't quite crept into it. Governments haven't quite crept into it. Uh, they've just stayed on the perimeter waiting, I think, but they won't hesitate to act if they have to. Um, I remember, I think it was Greg Murphy uh, had a, mm. race, a race car once and on the back bumper, he was sponsored by ACC and it said something like, you yeah. know, always obey the two second rule, i.e. always stay two seconds back behind me, don't get too close. Um, yeah. And I wonder if the athletes can do the same. They can do social distancing. Yeah. So they will have to be two metres apart, which will make for an interesting 100 metre race, I wonder. Yeah. <laughs> hey, mate, well, well, we're, we've got the good news from SEN's point of view, SENZ's point of view, and we've got two ladies on the ground over there. So Kirsty and Ricky, Kirsty Stanway and Ricky Swinell are both on the ground over there. They've arrived, and um, we will be able to get anything pretty much up to date on the radio station, whatever time of day it is. So. Uh, we're lucky in that regard. 
Hey, uh, Smithy, thanks for jumping in and having a chat with us this morning. SENZ all kicks off tomorrow morning from 6am. You can catch Smithy on New Zealand's newest 24-7 sports radio network. SENZ weekdays from 9am and it all starts tomorrow. Um, is it going to be a sleepless night tonight or is it going to be a looking forward to a comfortable uh, night? Mate, I'm 64 years of age and I'm nervous as hell. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know this is a... This is a, it's not, radio's not new to me, but this venture is. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people put a lot of work into setting this up and, and made a big commitment. There's a lot of people who have gone from one job to another job because of their passion. And, and um, you know, you kind of feel responsible being, uh, being in the front line of getting it right. So, there will, you know, it's like anything uh, in, in uh, broadcasting. There will be little bits that we have to work on after show one. There will be little bits after show two. But as we get through... Um, if I can end up sounding uh, a little bit like Brendan Telfer in terms of authority <laughs> and respect, I'll be a happy man. Murray Deakey, you've mentioned him. Um, those kind of people. Um, if, if, if I can get that, uh, get it to that point, Pat, I'll be a very, very happy man. Ian Smith, thanks for joining us. No problem at all.